Our uh, third speaker uh, today is going to be uh, John Athanasatos. Uh, he is a, a doctor of uh, pharmacy, has a master's of uh, divinity, uh, coming to us from East Elmhurst, uh, New York, and going to speak to us about the opioid pandemic. Hello, everybody. So, yes, I've been a registered pharmacist uh, for 15 years, mostly in retail setting, both uh, chain and private stores. I also um, had my own store for six years in Astoria. And I did go to seminary at St. Vladimir's, got a Master of Divinity um, in 2011, and recognized one of my classmates, uh, Father Adrian. Um, as he mentioned before, pandemic, why pandemic? You hear epidemic, but they're basically two Greek words. You know, an, ep an epidemic is a widespread occurrence in a specific area. A pandemic, on the other hand, is when it spreads out throughout different states, regions, cities, and throughout a whole country, perhaps the world. So I know we don't hear that. That's kind of a word that I chose to use specifically, pandemic, because I believe that it's everywhere throughout the world. In fact, you know, in 2018, UNAC, uh, United Nations on Drugs and Crime, launched an organization-wide strategy to deal with the deadly opioid crisis, which is mainly affecting North America, parts of Africa, the Middle East, and threatening to spread more widely. So that clearly says it's a pandemic. Um, prescription, you know, painkillers, um, as classified uh, class two drugs, examples as we know, methadone, morphine, oxycodone, oxymorphone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, and codeine. Um, how do I turn on the video? Well, basically the 1960s, Flower Power, Woodstock, drugs were big, you know, and I always like this quote um, from Dragnet. I'll tell you what I know. I know that, in fact, too many kids that begin with pot end up with heroin, then on to LSD. I know that if you drink, you suffer a loss of judgment, if you drink to excess. But I also know that judgment returns when you sober up. I know, and so do you, when you flip out on an acid trip, you never know when you're going to slip out again. This is now, Bentley, not a couple of years ago. We've had time now to see and study the effects of LSD. People who haven't had a dose in weeks sail out on another trip. They never know when. The minute they drop one acid capsule or ingest it in any way, they bought the farm. They've lost any chance to depend on and even restore that most precious of all inner senses, judgment. And in my way of thinking, without judgment, you might as well be dead. Your brain is, so why not the rest of you? We were talking about marijuana. We still are. Marijuana is the flame. Heroin is the fuse. LSD is the bomb. So don't you try to equate liquor with marijuana, mister. Not with me. You may sell that jazz to another pothead, but not to somebody who spends most of their time holding some sick kid's head while he vomits and wretches sitting on a curbstone at 4 o'clock in the morning. And when his knees get enough starch back in him so he can stand up and empty his pockets, you can bet he'll turn out a stick or two of marijuana. And you can double your money. He'll be holding a sugar cube or a cap or two. So don't you con me with your mind expansion slob. I deal with kids every day. I try to clean up the mess that people like you make out of them. I'm the expert here. You're not. No, you can't say any better than that. He was right that that is the uh, fuse. I'm sorry, the match. And then the fuse, obviously, is heroin, which was an opioid. 200,000 people and counting have died in this. 72,000 just in 2017 alone. As we know, Trump, probably one of the best things he's done is actually acknowledge this nationwide and say that it was a crisis last year. So this thing has really spiraled out of control. Um, there's just some numbers, as you see, you know, uh, 42,000 people died from opioid, uh, overdosing on just opioid, 81,000 used heroin for the first time. So obviously the numbers are staggering in all different types that we see every day, and on average 130 people a day die from opioid-related deaths. So. The numbers speak for themselves on this. Um, I want to point to this next video. Um, I don't know how. Yeah. The um, I really because the videos really speak a lot, and I really wanted to show that these things are really all over TV. 60 Minutes, for example, uh, local news, a lot of documentaries. This next one really was a blockbuster, I believe. 60 Minutes Rewind. In October, we joined forces with the Washington Post and reported a disturbing story of Washington at its worst. 
about an act of Congress that crippled the DEA's ability to fight the worst drug crisis in American history, the opioid addiction crisis. Now, a new front of that joint investigation. It is also disturbing. It's the inside story of the biggest case the DEA ever built against a drug company, the McKesson Corporation, the country's largest drug distributor. It's also the story of a company too big to prosecute. In 2014, after two years of painstaking inquiry by nine DEA field divisions and 12 U.S. attorneys, investigators built a powerful case against McKesson for the company's role in the opioid crisis. Our reporting turned up the leader of the DEA team, David Schiller, who tells, for the first time, how his investigators hit a brick wall in Washington when they tried to hold the powerful company accountable. This is the best case we've ever had against a major distributor in the history of the Drug Enforcement Administration. How do we not go after the number one organization? In the height of the epidemic, when people are dying everywhere. Doesn't somebody have to be held accountable? McKesson needs to be held accountable. Holding McKesson accountable meant going after the fifth largest corporation in the country. So as you just heard for yourself, so drug manufacturers, the three big ones, Amerisource, Bergen, McKesson, and Cardinal, um, I'm sorry, those are the drug distributors. Manufacturers, the biggest one involved with this was Mallinckrodt, known for making these drugs and selling them in high numbers to the distributors, knowing that they were going to be abused and were being abused. Um, pain management centers, I know, talked to him yesterday in Florida, they were more common than McDonald's on a common block. Just walk in there, get what you need, and walk out. It'd be crowded, you know, hundreds of thousands of people coming in there each day, doctors just making millions on these things. Pharmacies, private stores also, they come in there, you know, a lot of uh, pharmacies got in trouble doing too many of these things, selling them without prescriptions. It was just spiraling out of control. And it even made its way to the black market, obviously, El Chapo is the best example with this, trafficking, all these drugs. So it was all over the place. This thing has spiraled out of control. Uh, this next video, yeah. One more, just a quick glimpse of this. This morning, we follow up investigation from 60 Minutes and the Washington Post on the opioid crisis that kills nearly 100 people every day. 100 people in the first joint investigation out in October. Whistleblowers revealed how a new law weakened the DEA's ability to stop suspicious drug shipments within the U.S. This new investigation focused on the biggest opioid case the DEA ever pursued against a drug company. Retired DEA agent Dave Schiller spoke for the first time to 60 Minutes. He says that the settlement against drug company McKisson was too lenient. Here's a preview of Bill Whitaker's report. They hit him with a few million dollar fine, which compared to the billions that they were making is not. I think this next video is, yeah. 60 Minutes Rewind. In the midst of the worst drug epidemic in American history, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration's ability to keep addictive opioids off U.S. streets was derailed. That, according to Joe Renacisi, one of the most important whistleblowers ever interviewed by 60 Minutes. Renacisi ran the DEA's Office of Diversion Control, the division that regulates and investigates the pharmaceutical industry. Now, in a joint investigation by 60 Minutes and the Washington Post, Renacisi tells the inside story of how, he says, the opioid crisis was allowed to spread, aided by Congress, lobbyists, and a drug distribution industry that shipped almost unchecked hundreds of millions of pills to rogue pharmacies and pain clinics, providing the rocket fuel for a crisis that over the last two decades has claimed 200,000 lives. This is an industry that's, that's out of control. What they want to do is do what they want to do and not worry about what the law is. And if they don't follow the law, in drug supply, people die. That's just it, people die. Joe Renacisi is a tough, blunt, former DEA Deputy Assistant Administrator with a law. I'm Lisa Evers, and this is Street Soldiers. Fox 5 and Hot 97 present 
Street Soldiers with Lisa Evans. Getting off drugs isn't easy, and many people fail. So with a drug epidemic touching every community, how do you overcome addiction before it's too late? Mac Miller's comments in a 2016 Fader documentary take on tragic meaning after his death of an apparent drug overdose on September 7th. He was 26 years old, had a new album, and was about to go on a world tour. It's painful to watch as French Montana warns him about a potent mixture of lean, soda mixed with codeine cough syrup syrup and other substances. When you're taking something like lean, it is such a gateway into that euphoric opiate type of a high. Miller lost his battle with substance abuse, and unfortunately, he's not alone. A New York City Health Department survey found overdose deaths rose in 2017, taking the life of one New Yorker every six hours. Dr. Arabia Molette sees it in her emergency room. People of all races ethnicities, religious groups, and um, ages, from school-aged children to someone's grandmother. Drugs like heroin, cocaine, pills, and K2 increasingly are laced with a synthetic opioid fentanyl, which is the main factor in the rising death toll. We saw an FDNY paramedic and NYPD officers trying to deal with a man who had apparently overdosed in the middle of a South Bronx street. I'm just you know, flabbergasted at how each day, every hour, on the hour of how many people that come into the emergency department overdose on opiates or Molly or, or K2. Marijuana is not marijuana. It's a combination of rat poisoning, fentanyl, all these type of drugs. Promethrocodine, people come in the pharmacy. I didn't hear them cough once, but yet they need 300 milliliters of this, and the doctor's writing it for them. So it really has gotten out of control. And you heard that lady say, because it's not just people, low-income projects, it's everybody. People that went in for lower back pain or knee pain or had surgery, that were just given a few tablets of hydrocodone or oxycodone, it ended up getting out of control. The doctors had a responsibility to make sure, because they're the ones controlling it, to say, this person's had enough, or evaluate it, an MRI, whatever needs to be done to evaluate, is this really pain? or is this just the person just needs it? As you saw, it starts from the top. The drug manufacturers make these drugs. They knew they were addictive. They're making them addictive. As you saw, the DEA agents admit there was no regulation. The distributors were pushing them out in areas where they knew the doctors. They were getting kickbacks. They were pushing this more on their patients because they knew they were getting Some of them were even selling them, giving fake patients to go out there, get the scripts, give them back to the doctor. He would give them money, and he would sell them. This is what's going on. Um, and it affects everybody of all races, religions. Everyone is affected. No one is immune. And like we said, acknowledge the severity of the problem, build a greater awareness. There's three categories of people. There's the addicts and the recovering addicts, I believe, that need to be ministered to. There's the families and friends of those addicts. And then the last thing is the health professionals. Who's ministering to them? They need pastoral care. PTSD is a lot more awareness on this of our veterans, and rightly so. You know, people who were in, uh, in the military years ago, especially the Vietnam War, came out with PTSD, was not recognized until recently, so many years later, which is unfortunate. Thankfully, now it's becoming more aware. I really believe the health professionals, are su especially those who are conscientious, orthodox Christians for our group, they are suffering from this because of moral and ethical challenges that they're seeing. When you see people dying, and you give someone a prescription or wrote a prescription, you found that person died. You have to live with that. And that's not easy to do. And even if it was by accident, you still have to acknowledge that and take responsibility. So this is definitely a problem. And we should reach out to these three groups. I think they need it. Right here in New Jersey, you have a program called Reach NJ. There's a program in Long Island and New York, uh, Thrive. There's another one called FIST. So there's definitely some groups. I think having one uh, for Orthodox would be great. As we mentioned before, Narcotics Anonymous, Narnon, which is for the families and friends of addicts. And, you know, we need to create one for the health professionals. Of course, they're free to join Narnon, but I think specifically so they can kind of share their experiences and stories. Uh, for the addicts and recovering addicts, I always like to look at the parable of the prodigal son as a great example of struggle and triumph. Okay? So that's the hope uh, for them, that no matter how bad they've gone, the Father, God is waiting for their return. 
And for the families and friends of the addicts, I like to think of John 15, 12 to 13. This is my command that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Sometimes the family members suffer more than the addicts, seeing it and struggling with it and being there for them, whether it's losing money, whether it's being hurt by them, whatever it is, they're suffering, and of course, seeing them, God forbid, to die. So they are definitely, whatever they can do to prevent that, they're laying down their own, giving of themselves to help that person. And for the health professionals, Matthew 10, 16, 21, Behold, I send you as a sheep in the midst of wolves. Where, therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Because this is what's going on out there. And you are picking up your cross for the health professionals out there. Because it's not easy. And you hear the government is behind this. Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter. Collectively, they're not doing enough to pass legislation to stop it. And they have the power to do so. And... I always like to think of this, you know, before the Battle of the Million Bridge against Maxentius, St. Constantine the Great looked up to heaven, beheld the sign of the precious and life-giving cross, and under it says, and this sign conquer. And this is what we have to think, the power of the cross, that this is our cross that we have to pick up, that we have our hope in Christ, the same way Constantine did so that day. And so many of the saints, Nestor, when he fought Laius, when he went to Demetrius, can give us many examples of triumph in the Orthodox faith. This is what we need to do as, um, as you know, healthcare workers. And, you know, I mean, personally, I've seen this firsthand. It's, um, you know, the retail setting. I see it all the time. And it's a big problem. And, you know, to see, um, you know, the government not take responsibility for it, to see it spiral out of control, it's a big problem. We do have things available, like I mentioned, the 12-step programs and individual priests who have the, the ability that are also counselors and have this background to assist in it. But it's an uneasy thing. And there's that stigma, people that are using drugs, you don't want to be associated and you're afraid. But the thing is that this, they need that love, they need that understanding. And first of all, I think among anything that we have to realize as Christians, we have that duty to reach out to the people of all addicts and diseases. And I think that, you know, it's not just, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We mentioned about marijuana. And New York especially, I mean, in this state, New Jersey, they just decriminalize it. The governor wants to legalize it. In New York, they're fighting so hard. Mary Cuomo wants to push for it. He's probably going to get it. In the midst of an opioid crisis to legalize marijuana, well, I know people have different opinions of it, but honestly, it can only hurt. It cannot help the problem. It's only going to make it worse. So, and there are other drugs that are abused as well. I didn't mention here. There's amphetamines that are abused a lot. People taking them for no reason. Joe Friday said the acid. That's the amphetamines that are being abused. You know, people. That's why Sudafed is behind the counter, um, because people take it to make speed. We're surrounded by these things. They're everywhere. And what's sad is our youth are getting their hands on them and um, getting out of control. How am I doing on time? Five minutes? Oh, stop. No, ten. Oh, ten. So um, I cut those movies a little short, maybe. That's why. I'm right. But I, I think the, you know, I, I showed a lot. I think when you see these things on national television, that this thing has spiraled out of control to the numbers, to staggering numbers like this. And, you know, to kind of rewind and go back where it all started, it's difficult to put a pinpoint. But as you say, everything's happened the last 20 years. And where we identify the problem, we know it's spiraling out of control, and we are aware of the different programs that are available, obviously, to help with this problem. But I think the real question is, is um, you know, how do we start? It's a lot to tackle. So I think it's awareness. I think, uh, for example, in church bulletins, maybe they can um, have something, a piece on that to offer that in the back. Um, church can sponsor a local NA meeting or something. I mean, Father mentioned about, you know, God, that we have to take it out, you know, be, uh, the way the, the pressures of the politics and stuff like that. And yes, without God, these 12-step programs will fail. And any of these recovery programs, any of these uh, programs that they have, such as Thrive and uh, like that, I know we, you know, it's become a very secular nation, and it's under scrutiny and uh, religion, especially in schools. But the, the, this high, the first three steps, as we know, is 
we're powerless. We acknowledge there's a higher being greater than ourselves and our submission to the will. So those last two steps is that compliance. And the, not to do that is the resistance. And in my opinion, the resistance is the pride and the compliance is the humility. And that's what it really comes to. The person that wants to be saved, the person that wants to be healed, needs to humble himself just as the prodigal son did. And, you know, the person who doesn't do that, unfortunately, is being prideful. But we mustn't judge them because maybe where they are in their life, the status, their mental status, or perhaps they're just not realizing where they are. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know, it gets out of control to the point of death, unfortunately. But we need, hopefully, that the people who surround these people will reach out to them and they will listen. But ultimately, it's their decision to want to be helped. The people around them, as much as they want to see it and then get help and stuff like that, they have to want it themselves. They have to say, I have a problem. I need this. So... Um, I think this is the main thing. Um, this is a big challenge. I think in the Orthodox world, we need more awareness of this problem, to address it, like we do all these other issues. And we shouldn't be afraid to talk about it and to encourage discussion about it. Because, um, you know, in every community, there's always going to be people. We might not think they are, but the numbers are there. Maybe they're not as obvious as we might think, but they're there. And like that other show that I I just showed you Street Soldiers. It's on actually every Friday night. In fact, tonight they're talking about Wendy Williams' recovery or addiction. So that's I'm looking forward to watching that tonight. Hope you guys, um, I don't know if it's, it's in the New York area, the Channel 5, but every Friday they have a special on this. Because in New York City, as you know, it's probably one of the worst among Florida also, but New York City, at least where I work and where I've been around for 15 years, it is just debilitating. And I don't see it getting better anytime soon, but hopefully with more awareness and programs available, I think, um, you know, by God's grace, we will see a change. That's it. Plenty of, plenty of time for questions and dialogue. Wow. Thank you very much. Um, so, thank you very much. So, are you, you presently have a, your own private pharmacy or you work for? No, to be honest, I sold my pharmacy, you know. You're not even doing the work anymore. <laughs> well, I, I really want to get out of pharmacy. I, <laughs> my goal is to become a priest, you know, yeah. and I, I just feel like I'm an accomplice to these things. And, you know, just being in this field and seeing this every day and saying, hey, do I have blood on my hands being involved in this? Just being there, just giving a prescription to somebody, and yeah. I hear you're addicted to it, and you and I try to stop you. You know, my hands are tied in a lot of ways. They can report me, I'm discriminating, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So you have to really know what you're doing to tell someone, I'm not going to fill it anymore. The common thing is the pharmacies say, oh, we don't have it, we don't have it, we don't have it. And then you see more... Um, robberies and shootings over these things. Mm -hmm. You know, how many pharmacies have been robbed for these things? So it's, it's a horrible, horrible environment. And like I said, the ethical, moral challenges we face are just every day there's something. And it's just hard to avoid it. Yeah, at the chain pharmacies, maybe it's a little bit easier. They cut down on that a lot. Maybe the there's a re there's a registry, right? So well, there's a registry, but I think the chain pharmacies are more regulated. Maybe they you don't see as much, but they push it on the private store. So go to mm -hmm. the private store across the street. He has what you want. This that. So they kind of set you up for that, and yeah. it's it's bad. It's it's really bad. I've seen it get worse over the years. I've oh. seen it get worse, but I just, retail pharmacy, I just didn't want to be involved in this because I see one out of every three prescriptions is some sort of narcotic. If that's how you're going to make money, I don't want it. I don't, that's not something I want to be a part of. Yeah. God, God bless you for you know, coming to that place, even though now you have to have a livelihood. Well, look, it, you know, it's even doctors and, I mean, there's just a lot of people are, you know, we have to live with ourselves and... We want to be doing, we want to do something in our lives that's meaningful, that's helping people. Not that we're not, I'm not saying pharmacy is not helping people, but it's just, you have to deal with all this bureaucracy, and I think it just gets out of control. Yes? Um, I think we've all heard it before. Um, 
I'm 20 years old. Uh, middle school, high school, um, having debates about marijuana specifically, uh, whether it should be legalized or not, um, whether it's an addictive or not, um, if it's okay to do. Um, sort of whenever I get into this sort of discussion, um, I don't have anything to say when somebody says, oh, the United States could could tax this and make a lot of money off of it. Or, um, you know, it's not addictive. And then I do my research and I really don't see anything that proves that it's actually addictive like cigarettes or, or, or heroin or cocaine. Um, what is something that I, that I could say to that? Not necessarily in an orthodox standpoint, um, but just generally, because you could, if you're having a discussion with another orthodox, you could say, oh, well, it's a sin. You're polluting your body. I mean, that's something you could easily say, but for somebody who's not religious, not orthodox, what is... Well, to answer your question, first of all, it's not so much marijuana by itself is dangerous. It's the combination of marijuana with alcohol. Because when we drink alcohol, we're drunk, we want to vomit it out. Marijuana, they give it to cancer patients for nausea, so they don't vomit. So one is inhibiting the process of the other, so basically the alcohol toxicity is raising your body and you die. So that's the combination is so lethal. So how many young people, for example, are not going to, if alcohol and marijuana is everywhere, are not going to be tempted to use both? And the access, you want to get a job at Home Depot, you want to operate machinery, you want to work in pharmacy, CVS, you have to pass a drug test. If you're testing positive for these things, they're not going to give you a job. So they say they're going to legalize it, but they're still going to enforce that companies can restrict it. So how's that going to work? Plus, I just think the more something is open and available, people tend to abuse it. We have a pile of sweets on the table. Oh, I want to try one. You know, like the old saying with Tostitos, you can't, but you can't only have just one. I mean, if something's around us, it's just very difficult. It takes a lot of willpower to avoid it. Not everybody has that discipline spirituality. And people who are careless with other things in their life, yeah, they, they will be careless with that too. So the thing is, it is a money maker with this thing. That's why they're pushing it. They want the money for it. I know that's what they're looking at. But money in exchange for blood, I, I see it. I'm sorry. Yes. Can, I, can I, was it Vasily who just came yes. up? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a retired hippie, okay? Oh, jeez. <laughs> and, 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 and what I smoked back then was about one hundredth the strength of what they have on the, on the streets now. I'm a smart guy, and I'm not saying that to brag. I have a master's degree in Chinese medicine, not an easy thing to get. But when I was smoking this very weak marijuana, I was very happy washing dishes in a restaurant. You know, it, it takes away your motivation. Yeah. And the, the other thing is, like, in the midst I forgot to mention, the FDA, there's a lot of controversy trying to p promote this. They just passed this drug called Desuvia, which is a, a thousand times more potent than morphine. They want to put this on the market in the midst of this crisis. So all I see here is money, money, and money. I see more drugs they want to produce, more addictive, more powerful. I see they want to legalize marijuana, not because of it, mostly for the money. And like you just said, it decreases your motivation. Someone's driving and they're high and all these things. I mean, it's just I can't see how it's going to be productive. Yes, medical use marijuana for cancer and stuff like that, but even that. I'm sure people, the same way they found a way to get their hands on these other drugs and abuse them, this going in a dispensary and getting what you want, maybe they're selling it to somebody else. This is, you know, this is what I, I just see it, there's no positive. I mean, someone needs, you know, to meditate and uh, do the Jesus prayer. I mean, why do you have to turn to a drug of any kind? So I, I just think that there's just no positivity with these things at all. I just think that it's just, unfortunately, the government or whatever companies, you know, pushing this, and unfortunately, these are the victims. 
you know, I mean, it used to be believed that it was, um, you know, related to poor income areas and projects and stuff. I mean, New York City, I see that all the time. Like, I work around people. I work around African Americans and Hispanics. Yeah, 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 you're white. You don't understand. We grew up with this. We, this is what we know in the hood and the projects. I understand. They don't have maybe the, the same opportunities that I had or some of us had, but they do have a choice in a way to break away from it. You know, you see gun violence and all these things and gangs and stuff. Yes, can we fix these problems? No, not that easily. But there's always hope. There's always hope. I always believe that. It's a choice in life that we make. So, I don't, I don't know. Any other questions? Yes. Oh. Hi, uh, my name is Mina. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and uh, aspiring hippie. Wow. Uh, Maybe I I I I, uh, I hope that one day. When I said flower power. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I I didn't have the uh, benefit of living in living in the '60s where you know uh, having fun was normalized. I uh, grew up in a uh, Coptic environment where math and uh, spelling bees was normalized. So uh, it's it's a different kind of. Uh, 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 world view uh, but but that point that you just made about you know it's just another drug and it's just another source of satisfaction I think that that's a universal human problem that we have that people are looking for satisfaction in the wrong places um, and one of the concerns that I have um, is sometimes there's like an othering of opioids and drug addictions and things like that that isn't really necessary when we have strugglers of our own so regardless of whether you grew up as a hippie and you you know you, you did that well <laughs> what do you mean I gave one. oh yeah but i i mean regardless of the semantics of the the ontology of it but the 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 idea of i was this and i like for me right now i don't see myself as being any different from uh the addicts and these people it's just that we're addicted to different things even if the addiction is success or addiction to uh ego or addiction to something else i think the uh, the problem of being addicted to something is universal and then when we come to this question of the the marijuana and the legalization and the conflating of the two with the opioid crisis i think as an orthopedic surgeon i prescribe a lot of opioids for people after surgery people sometimes want a refill on that uh opioid and you know we have sort of strict rules in my office about when you get refills when you don't get refills the patients and you know sometimes people want them if they haven't had surgery um there's a strict rule against that across the board where it's like no because if you're dealing with an acute problem where you've had an injury or you've had a surgery and you need opioids to get you through that early phase that's fine but if you're going to use it chronically then it's not even it's not even that it's ill advised it just doesn't work it, it your your body uh gets used to it so the even despite having these strict rules, I did have a patient. So I've, I've been in practice for five years, and I've had one guy who, you know, was a little early on uh, getting his refill. We called him. We said, listen, you're taking too much of this. Take it easy. Uh, we don't like to refill this, uh, but you can get one refill, and then that'll be it. That following Monday, I get a phone call. He OD'd. Yeah. So it, it's kind of a challenging thing when, you know, despite – being anti-narcotics, anti-opioids, it's still out there uh, to the point where I have a friend who's a physician who recently uh, overdosed himself. I know. So and it becomes like, a, okay, is there is there a is there a way to avoid all these things? And all the comments that you made and all the advocacy groups, those are all. Uh, great, but un unfortunately, I think one of the things that we have to consider is the cannabinoid pain receptors being researched and targeted. And if it becomes legalized, then that opens up that area for research. And I kind of find myself in a in a place where I'm advocating for something that I think is bad. Again, I'm a aspiring hippie. I'm not a former hippie. I'm not a current hippie. I don't smoke marijuana, but. Uh, but it's <laughs> but it's one of those things where in a world of evils, right, is this the, the lesser of many evils? Marijuana. Right, marijuana being. Um, and if framed the right way, is it something that in certain patient demographics that 
otherwise would be taking narcotics, can they be prescribed well, like marijuana? Said, the mar- like the medical marijuana, like I mentioned, that right. has its benefits. We're talking about recreational marijuana legalization. Right. right. In New York, it's spiraling out of control. The governor is, you know, pushing this like anything. That's the problem. Someone who didn't do any drugs now is going to go and try it because it's so easy to buy it, and they're going to go start using it and maybe lead their way down to heroin or these other things or K2 marijuana. Think about the mislabeling of that, K2 marijuana, K2. Oh, okay, synthetic marijuana. Oh, I'll try that. It sounds cool. It's organic. I'm going to try it. And that's when they make the wrong decision. Most people die from that thinking, thinking that it was synthetic, organic, a type of marijuana, and they died from it. This is the problem in all money making. Yes, please. Um, well, that perfectly ties into like my sort of question. I want to hear. Um, so I, I'm a student, so I'm just kind of learning about this stuff. I haven't had a personal experience in the professional field yet. Um, but in a neuroscience class that I was taking that focused on the psychology of addiction, um, we learned about how some people have um, the proclivity towards addiction. So there is um, a mechanism. I forget it exactly because this was like last year. I'm not the best student. <laughs> but they have, there's like some sort of mechanism in the brain that some people do get addicted and some people don't get addicted. Um and I've seen that where, I mean, marijuana use is crazy prevalent in any and all societies, like you said. I mean, you see it literally everywhere. I mean, five years ago when I was in high school, like, it was weird if you didn't smoke. Right. Everyone did. You just assumed everyone did, which is horrible. And a lot of the people, because they had that ad- that proclivity towards addiction moved from marijuana to something harder because they became addicted not because marijuana is addictive but because they had that addiction in them and that like triggered them which you I guess you could get addicted really to anything but I guess my question is is that how could we or is there a way to find out if someone has that tendency for addiction, family history, and then use that, or if you already do use that, I'm not really sure, to kind of minimize people, like if you do have a tendency towards addiction, maybe don't give them the narcotics and have like a something else. I don't know if that's a possibility or, but it's just a question, yeah, a thought. It's okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, There is a genetic predisposition. Yes. Anybody can get addicted to any substance with sufficient use. Frequency, use, you could become an addict. I could become an addict, and I've seen it too many times. So no one is, you know, maybe you have, if your mom mom or dad are a drug addict or an alcoholic, 25% more likely. Both parents, 50%. Any drug you use, um, you can get addicted to. And And I gave the young man here, is a Dr. Bertha Madras, she has done tremendous study. If you want to see what marijuana does to the adolescent brain, it basically your memory goes. It's 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 psychologically addicting and it does serious damage. You don't have to go any further than that to mess up your life. And I'm sitting with these high school kids. I'm not feeling real hopeful for the future. Now she might not remember. You remember what happened to those commercials? This is your brain, and this is your brain on drugs, and it scrambles the egg. Yeah. Well, how come I've we don't that. see that anymore? Yeah. <laughs> but that's what I grew up with. You remember that? You might be young. And I, reco- I saw it in class. And I recommend it. you guys have an Orthodox Christian Fellowship chapter. Yeah. At your, uh, and these are some of the issues you guys should discuss yeah. because these things do affect specifically college students. A lot of peer pressure in schools, sororities, fraternities. Yeah. Have a group, have an OCF to discuss these kinds <laughs> of issues because you know what? This is big. People are struggling just like you with this. There's a lot of pressure. Yeah. And sometimes the devil's a lot stronger than we think he is. And we need to be united. Our pride is, oh, I can handle it. Our humble is like, I need help. I need support. And that's why, like I said, OCF, I forgot to mention that, would be a great thing to have yeah. at your campus. Where do you go to school? I actually go to Hellenic College, so oh. you know, have an OCF because our school is an yeah. OCF. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. 
Thank you very much. Can, can, can I make one more comment? Uh, yeah. Plug for my profession, acupuncture. Nice. Okay. Um, it's absolutely fabulous for it pain is. control. And it's also absolutely fabulous in helping people get off of addiction. There, there are, there are, there's That's a needle true. prescription for the ear called the NADA protocol. That's right. I've heard of that, yes. And, and it, it's, it's fabulous for helping people. Uh, it, it reduces the, the cravings. Uh, it uh, just, you know, all kinds of things. One of, the, one of the studies that they've done is if someone receives al uh, uh, acupuncture while they're on an opioid painkiller prescribed, they need less of it and they don't need it as often if they're getting acupuncture while they're on that. Uh, so if somebody, in, if somebody is in pain, send them to an acupuncturist. Leave your card. Cause, well, <laughs> but I'm just saying, I'm, that, I mean, send them to an acu, like the, Dr. Ma when you were saying that, you know, these people want, want, uh, want opiates when all they are is having a, an acute pain, send them to an, uh, uh, an uh, acupuncturist. Acupuncturist will more than likely help them get rid of their pain. Oh, I know it doesn't, but I'm just saying. I know, and that's and that's a and that's a problem too, that uh, that uh, acupuncture isn't uh, paid for by insurance, and that's it right. should be. That's right. Very true. Thank you very much, John.